Okay, so thank you for joining us today, Emma. Um, my name is Anna Lay. I am the Assistant Outdoor School Coordinator for the Calipu Watershed Council. Unfortunately, due to everything that's happening right now, outdoor school is canceled. So we are bringing outdoor school to you, to everyone at home right now, uh, with activities that we're going to be doing with the live stream. And um, today, primarily with macroinvertebrates, you can find the curriculum online on our website at calapua.org. So it's C-A-L-A-P-O-O-I-A.org. Um, there is an outdoor school resource section that you click on and then all of the curriculum should be on there for students and parents to do at home. Um, this is a pretty open topic, um, open discussion with Emma today, who is our guest biologist. And so as this live stream goes on, please feel free to like comment down below, shoot a bunch of questions. We have more than enough time to answer any of these questions today. Um, yeah, so I'm going to have Emma introduce herself. Thanks for having me again. Um, my name is Emma Garner. I'm a fish biologist with the Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. I am the salmon trout enhancement bi biologist out of Springfield. And so I work on a lot of uh, community science and um, education and outreach. Awesome. Cool. Mm -hmm. Thank you for joining us once again um, this week. Yeah. So for Thank folks who are tuning in right now, we did have Emma join us last week, but because there was like a huge outcry for like an encore, Emma returned and we're doing round two for macroinvertebrates. But we're going to start off um, with introducing the activity that we'll be doing today. Again, this curriculum is available online for everyone to do. Um, it's going to be very like a nice, simple activity um, using, sorry or like at home Play-Doh that you can make, um, any clay that you may have lying around or Play-Doh or anything that's like malleable. Or if you don't have any of that material right now, um, just pick up some colored pencils, pen and paper also works. But yeah, with us with this activity today, we're gonna be um, making and pretty much learning how to identify macroinvertebrates and talk more about what macroinvertebrates are and why they are important for the watershed. So Emma will be our biologist and she'll talk more about macroinvertebrates. So if you have any more questions, just please comment down below and we'll get to them. But yeah, Emma, do you wanna start with what macroinvertebrates are? And Yeah, so in the simplest form, we're talking about, um, today in particular, we're talking about aquatic macroinvertebrates. So an invertebrate is sort of an organism that has no internal skeletal structure or backbone. Um, and macro is something that you can see with an unaided eye. So we don't need microscopes to see them. We don't need large enhancements. We can kind of just look around. Um, you could also call them aquatic bugs, aquatic insects, creepy crawlies. Awesome. Whatever. <laughs> Although I hope people don't think they're creepy because they're very important. Great. Um, yeah, so we're going to be both doing activity as we'll answer a couple of questions. But yeah, Emma, you also tried out their like homemade Play-Doh recipe. How that worked out for you? It worked out really well. I I made the recipe that you, I know you guys have a couple recipes posted. Mm -hmm. um, I made the one that's called the real, the real deal. Yeah. Right? Yeah. yeah. Super easy and um, really simple. And mine has actually been in an airtight container for like a week. Mm -hmm. And it's still, it's still really great and not dried out. Awesome. Thanks. Um, yeah, so again, our like homemade Play-Doh recipe is also online. I test proof every single recipe that's posted just to ensure that it works well with um, whatever materials you may have in the pantry. Specifically, if you have like flour or salt or lemon juice, um, it can be as simple as putting all those ingredients together and mixing it with boiling water. Um, so you don't have to leave your house. Just please stay inside and be safe and just use the materials that you have. But yeah, we're going to start with our activity. And uh, with this activity, we're just going to each choose an aquatic macroinvertebrate and then try to sculpt or mold looking primarily at different 
body characteristics, features that makes them who and what they are pretty much. And then we'll dive in into why it's important that macroinvertebrates are here and um, what that means for a watershed. So Emma, what kind of macroinvertebrate are you going to be crafting today? I'm going to do, for anyone who's watching who was here last time, I'm going to stick to the same macro because I think they're super cool. I'm going to do a caddis fly. And a caddis fly, I have a little picture in my ID book. A caddis fly is a more um, segmented macroinvertebrate. So um, it's got kind of this little wormy body with this head and claws that stick out. And they build protective cases around their bodies with um, organic material. So they protect themselves with sticks or rocks or twigs. And I went out in my backyard and collected some leaves and some grass and some sticks to sort of get a little bit creative with my caddisfly case. Mm -hmm. Awesome. What are you making? What are you making? I think I'm going to stick to some of, with last time I chose a water boatman. So I'm going to stick with that mm -hmm. one and then maybe incorporate like a water penny or a planarian. Um, so I can show folks at home what that may look like. So this is a water boatman. They have these like little oars that they use for swimming. This is a water penny and a planarian. I don't believe it's, oh, it's on here. It's a little flat worm, but very, nice. very simple. Um, yeah, so Emma, can you talk about why macroinvertebrates are important for the watershed? Of course. So um, macroinvertebrates, um, you can see them sort of crawling around on rocks. You can find them wiggling around in the dirt. Um, you can also find them flying around the water surface. Mm -hmm. So they sort of exist in a lot of different um, habitat types. So naturally, they are a really valuable food source for um, fish at many life stages for birds that live in and around water and for other bugs um, and some small mammals mm -hmm. that might kind of come out and feed on them. They're also something that we call a bioindicator species. So a bioindicator species is an organism or group of organisms where their presence in a water system tells us how healthy or unhealthy the system is. Okay. So macroinvertebrates, depending on what kind you see, you could go in and you could say, oh, there's a lot of worms in here and a lot of leeches and not a lot of bugs flying around and think, oh, maybe it's less healthy. Mm -hmm. And then a stream that has um, caddis flies or um, a more variety of different species, and you would know that it was a little bit healthier water system. Great, and then can you like talk more about like what quantifies as an unhealthy or healthy water system? Like what does that look like? Yeah, so from a bug perspective or fish perspective, a healthy water has a lot of dissolved oxygen that organisms that live in the water can breathe and um, they survive on that. Um, it is clear water that you can usually see through for the most part, uh -huh. see down to the rocks. It has a lower temperature, which helps maintain, maintain those oxygen levels. And it has kind of a healthy mix of rocks and vegetation. And something that is maybe on the less healthy side could be water that is a little bit more murky, so the temperature is higher, which means there's less oxygen in the water. Mm -hmm. um, it could have a lot of um, sand or silt, oh, very nice, kind of swirling around, which makes it hard for organisms to live in that habitat. Awesome. Yeah, no, that makes a lot of sense on why you find some macrovertebrates in different areas throughout, like, a stream, I guess. 
Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, speaking on like different macro and bird risks, do are they seasonal? Like, do they? Do you know if they? Um, if you find the same ones year round or in different areas, like, what does that look like in terms of for a fish per se? Yeah. So macroinvertebrates, there's a variety of them, but they, they change, they have different life cycles. So some will be worms their whole life. Some will be little beetles and some will start as more of a larva or a worm, which mm -hmm. is the very early stage. And then the older they get or the further down in their life cycle, they'll get wings and they'll fly around. So they're, at a, they're used as a food source in many of their life stages by fish. Um, at the smaller, earlier life stage, maybe smaller fish feed on them. And then while they're flying around, you might see larger fish like trout or steelhead adults mm -hmm. feeding on them. So... Right now, there are some hatches of various flies, like mayflies or stoneflies are two types. And so if you lived near water or if you were sort of taking some time to be near water and you might see kind of clouds of um, insects flying around, mm -hmm. then you would know that there was kind of a hatch. So they're, they're a little dried out, but... Um, like this is, you can kind of hardly see it. This is a dragonfly at its early stage. Mm -hmm. And then this is a dragonfly later. So these are the same insect. These are the same macroinvertebrate, just at different stages in their life. So early on, you'll see it crawling along the rocks and mm -hmm. then later on you'll see it flying around the water. Yeah, and typically when people think of dragonflies, they think of the ones flying around, right? Yes. Yeah. I mean, I did until I learned that they also scoot around rocks. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. And I am aware that there are kind of different types of macroinvertebrates, such as like the the area that they're feeding in. Can you talk more about that? Like, um, like scrapers and. Um, oh yeah. So macroinvertebrates, for the most part, are broken into four feeding groups. Um, and the feeding groups are, uh, let's see, so the, there's collectors, and sometimes people will also put um, collector or filtration in there. And so what they do is they gather organic material like leaves or um, plant material, and they live on the stream bed mm -hmm. on the bottom, and they'll kind of collect organic material that's either floating by them or settling on the bottom, and that's what they'll feed off of. And, They're also. Oh, sorry. I was like, some no, examples could be like mussels, right? Um, they filter. They filter. Yeah, so they'll filter stuff. But like, um, the caddisfly. Like, there's a species. There's a type of caddisfly that will build kind of like a spider web underwater, and they'll kind of string this material between the rocks and then it collects um, leaf litter as it flows by. So they live on a stream bottom and they need um, uh, water that's flowing mm -hmm. and water that has uh, healthy vegetation. Um, and then there are shredders. So they have chewing mouth parts uh, that they use to sort of, they shred leaves, they'll cut into leaves, they'll bite or they'll have a little thing that comes out of their mouth that bores, like forms a little hole in leaf litter. Mm -hmm. And that is how they will eat. And so that could be like a crane fly is a shredder. And then there are scrapers. So scrapers have kind of like a razor mouth part and they will scrape the algae off the rocks. Okay. So they'll live in spots in the stream where there's a little bit of sunlight, so algae's growing, and a lot of us know scrapers as, um, like, snails, something that kind of scoots, scoots along the rocks. And then there are predators, and so they will actively hunt other bugs and feed off of them. So dragonflies are a really big predator. Um, so if we, if we go scouting for macroinvertebrates and I collect 
a bunch. If I have a dragonfly, I need to put them in their own container so they don't cause trouble with all the other ones and try to try to have a tasty snack before I can see what's in there. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, thank you for clarifying everything. But I do have some pictures here of some of like what Emma has talked about so far. Um, here are some snails. A lot of people don't think snails are like haven't been macroinvertebrates. So those are some macroinvertebrates. Example, uh, mussels as well, freshwater mussels. Mm -hmm. And let's see. Maybe I can show a life cycle of what she's talking about. So um, she mentioned a caddis fly life history life cycle earlier and how throughout like a season they'll you know, go through different stages in our lives. And so here's a diagram of what that may look like. So larva to pupae to or like merger, like emergers, I guess. Um, and then adults. And then sometimes they'll just fly around. And also that goes back into like fly fishing. So the fly fishing community will actually look about at like what's hatching at the time and then use specific flies depending on what flies are available there, um, what the season's like, what the water's like. So just really connecting back with the stream that they're fishing in and using the flies to catch fish. Yeah, so whatever is flying around usually lets you know what the fish wanna be wanna eat. Mm -hmm. And so um, I have <laughs> I have a fly. Well, now I can't find it. I might have. Oh, there it is. Um, that someone made for me as a teaching tool. And so they'll make this little. It's like a little caddis fly. It's what I'm trying to build. And so some. Some um, caddis flies build their cases out of rocks, and then some build their cases out of organic material. Mm -hmm. And someone said, like, the March brown hatch right now that's happening. So that's a fun fact. And yeah, so if you see, if you see some, some stuff, some bugs being a little bit more active around the water, and it can help you if you have, like, a, a guidebook or you're using iNaturalist to learn a little bit more about the macros that are in a system you could you could um if you're having a hard time seeing them or identifying them you could use the time of year to sort of key in on what might be around mm -hmm. and then speaking about guides um i know emma you provide me with a couple of macroinvertebrate guides so i can mm -hmm. study up on them but for folks at home who don't have macroinvertebrate guides or want to get into you know fly fishing or macroinvertebrate identification there are a lot of resources online right now if you just Google it, like macro and word bread identification guides, um, there are plenty of young know, universities who have made PDF files for a lot of macro and vertebrates. You can go to your, like, your local watershed council or your fish and wildlife or fly fishing shop and ask. Fly fishing is a great one, yeah. yeah. So just asking about your local waterways, your local watersheds, what kind of flies you may be expecting to see. Um, I also found like taking pictures or even doing some of the activities that we're doing today to so really hone in identification skills, looking at specific characteristics, and then just taking notes so you can actually go home and narrow down what kind of macro invertebrates you're really looking at. Um, so yeah, just, you know, diving into the macro invertebrate world by using identification guides have, has been really fun so far and I'm learning a lot. Yeah, and there's a online, there's something called iNaturalist mm -hmm. that helps you identify a bunch of stuff, um, and they have a lot of really helpful pictures that can help you sort of key in on the bugs. Awesome. And then, again, we're taking questions, so feel free to just comment down below and we'll get to them. Um, yeah, and then the outdoor school coordinator put down – um, with a link down below that says Kalapua on our outdoor school resource section has a macro invertebrate guide as well that you can access. So thank you for that. And are how, there, oh, go ahead. Oh, I was going to ask how your um, how your macros are coming, how your how your artistic artistic expression is flowing. 
Okay, I can show one that I made so far, which is the water boatman. And um, <laughs> it looks like this. I That's use wonderful. the homemade Play-Doh and some pipe cleaners that I cut up into bits and pieces to use as like the ligaments right now. So what they are, what I focus on is pretty much like the oval shaped body that they have and some of like two of the or like features on the side of their body. So that's kind of replicate, replicated here with the pipe cleaners. Um, I just found out that they use them exactly as how I thought they were used was just pretty much crossing the water using, you know, stroke like motions as if you're doing like a breast stroke in the water or, you know, when you're rowing the boat. So that's pretty cool. But this is my artistic capabilities. Um, again, you don't have to be good at art at all. Um, I'm not really good at crafting right now. I'm better at drawing. So the rest of the invertebrates that I chose to identify will be drawn on my handy dandy sketchbook. What about you, Emma? Um, I wouldn't call myself artistic, but I think trying makes you as good as you can get. So I'm trying. Um, I made my little caddis fly. Same as last time, just as adorable, um, with its little case out of organic material. And, um, I don't believe this belongs as anything, but I'm making it. Um, cause, you know, some macroinvertebrates can be kind of, uh, squishy like worms, like, um, the one that you're drawing, or they can be kind of have more larger, harder shells, uh, like the beetles, and so I, oh no, I kind of just got creative and used some toothpicks, and I've got, you know, my very own, my very own backyard macro. Awesome. <laughs> and like, can you talk about how, like, what we're doing today, um, how that really helps us with identifying macroinvertebrates, like with body segments or with legs? Yeah. Um, I mean, it helps you identify them just by understanding what they look like. So um, someone just mentioned, I think it was Greenbelt mentioned, that iNaturalist has an app for kids called Seek. Mm -hmm. And so when people are using these guides, uh, you're, you're kind of learning based on pictures, which is a great way to learn, um, especially if you're very, I'm a very visual person. So it's hard for me to read information and know what I'm looking at. I really like to see information and sort of compare it to what I'm finding. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, if you just got online and you kind of looked at some pictures and you can kind of learn, you know, how many legs do most of them have? And, you know, like, what's their body structure like? And are they kind of more wormy or are they kind of more segmented? Like what you might see in an ant in your backyard. Um, and being creative with that and then maybe narrowing down traits that fit an actual macroinvertebrate. So like I made this guy not based on anything because I know macroinvertebrates have segmented. Some of them have segmented bodies and six legs. And then I can look on my guide and there are two macroinvertebrates that look a lot alike the mayfly and the stonefly, oh, you're on it. So the mayfly has um, three little kind of like hairs that come off of the tail. And so you can kind of think of those as the M in mayfly. And then a stonefly has two little hairs that come off of the tail, kind of like little antenna. And so I can break my toothpicks in half and kind of make make turn my bug into a stone fly these little skies i don't know if you ever seen them but they are the cutest things ever they're kind of like a water water like roly-poly or pill bugs depending on what you call them but they are adorable and um a lot of people will see like crawdads or crayfish or crawfish yeah. inside of streams. They're also an, an invert too. Um, and I know there are a couple of non-native species. And do you remember what they are, Emma? 
Oh my gosh, I do not have them memorized. I always get the native crawfish mixed up with the other one. I think it's, is it Signal? It is Signal. Is native, Signals are is native, native to the Pacific Northwest. And what you can do to identify them are these like bright white marks on their claws because they're signaling at you that they, Very nice. they are here. So. <laughs> Crayfish aren't my specialty, so yeah. I so I also have some fun things to learn with my guides for figuring out a little bit more about them. Yeah, and I think it could be fun too. Is like if you went in your backyard, if you have a yard, or if you're kind of find yourself outside on a walk and you see a bug crawling around, is you could look at it and you could think like, what would that bug need to live underwater? Mm -hmm. You know, and it's kind of get creative there too. And we have a question right now. It says, why, so why should we care about macroinvertebrates? Um, I think we should care about macroinvertebrates just on um, a basic level that they're organisms that live in uh, really special ecosystems. They live in our rivers and streams and ponds and lakes mm -hmm. and their presence just naturally is important, but um, they also provide a lot of food to the other animals that live around the area. Um, we talked earlier about food for fish and food for birds. Um, and so the more macros that are in a stream and the healthier the stream, the more other species you'll, the, the greater variety of other species you'll find awesome. in the stream. And then, do you have any fun facts about macroinvertebrates that you could share with us? Fun facts. Let's see. I already threw out my stonefly, mayfly, three-tail, two-tail. Um, so, so you showed earlier the life cycle of, um, like, a mayfly, how it hatches out to be an adult. Mm -hmm. And so, um, for a lot of species and other animals when they become adults they spend a significant amount of their time as adults and in macroinvertebrates those that kind of hatch out of their shell and grow wings they spend less time as adults than they do in sort of that pre-emergence stage and when they emerge as adults they'll stop eating and their goal is to kind of mate and lay eggs. And some of them live less than 24 hours flying around. Oh, wow. Yeah, so you could think of it as a really special moment if you get to see those guys flying out and around streams. My other fun fact is um, that they have gills. A lot of them, not all of them. Some of them have gills, just like uh, you would see fish, but obviously they're not up on their face. Um, so, like, if this was a little stonefly, or excuse me, mayfly, you would see a lot of little, um, they kind of look like little antennas. They would be coming off the tail, and those are their gills. I, sh I should have bookmarked some pages. <laughs> and those would be their gills. And then if it was a stonefly, it would have its gills underneath. Mm -hmm. But beetles that live underwater, they will swim up to the surface and they'll kind of collect this air bubble on their tummy and then they'll go back down underwater and they'll hold on to that air bubble and use that to breathe. That's pretty neat. And adorable. I think that's what the gills you're talking about, right? On a yeah. mayfly with all yeah, those the little surface area, like filament, phalanges connected to them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Yeah. And my, my, my goal is always to hear more people say that they think um, bugs and sort of the more crawly things that we find in nature are cute and adorable because it makes us <laughs> just put some more, put some more fun spin on them. You know, they're important. Yeah. We don't, we don't want to get scared and squish them or feel like they're going to hurt us because they're just kind of there doing their own thing. And then we're still opening it up for questions, so feel free to ask as many questions as you would like. 
Um, but Emma, how are you holding up with being inside right now? Like, are you still staying connected to nature? I'm trying. Um, it's difficult. Uh, as a fish biologist, usually this time of year, I'm outside all the time and I'm in streams and, you know, right now to be extra safe and extra cautious, just like everybody else, um, I'm staying inside mm -hmm. and I'm working from home. So I am fortunate to have a, a small backyard. So when I have time, I like to go sit in my backyard, um, with my dog. Uh, what about you? I am kind of hungered down right now, like you said, just being safe and taking advantage of our, like, neighborhood, outdoor area, picking up a lot mm -hmm. of information from these guides that I've accumulated over the years that I haven't been able to sit down and really learn from. So pretty much learning a lot about, like, macroinvertebrates or birds or fish and just getting ready to head out back outside when it's safe. So... Yeah, it's a really it's a really good time to really um, observe what lives around you every day. Mm -hmm. um, paying attention to the different types of birds that live near your house or bugs that are crawling around. I feel like there are things where until you adjust your eyes to it, you don't realize how many how many little critters are nearby. Mm -hmm. And so it's a nice time to learn about learn about the critters and and learn about what's out there a question for you emma is like how did you become a fish biologist how did i become a fish biologist i love being outside um so when i went to college i went to college at osu oregon state university in corvallis and i had grown up near Oak Creek. It's a tiny creek that's in Corvallis. It's near Bald Hill. And I grew up with a little portion of that flowing through my front yard and streams became my favorite place to be. They still are my favorite place to be. So I went to school to study streams and study what lives in streams and why they're important. And I started working with um, salmon on the coast mm -hmm. when they uh, migrate into spawn and I just fell in love and never looked back. <laughs> <laughs> so I've been working with fish ever since, and it's it's wonderful. That's awesome. And, like, education side, hence the macroinvertebrate background. But how's your uh, macroinvertebrate right now? They're okay. I have taken my simple art skills to build a little snail, to craft, craft a little a snail that's going to scrape its way along some rocks and and um, scrape up some algae. That's awesome. That's adorable. Anna, how did how did you become um, a biologist? Uh, I think we took the same path. Um, I also recently, gra well, I didn't recently graduate. I did. You didn't recently graduate from OSU. Um, but I also went to Oregon State University, recently graduated, and got into fisheries because my background started off as a, more of marine and then started falling in love with salmon. And so <laughs> went towards that route, I guess. <laughs> Still yeah. trying to figure it out. Yeah, it's a, cre it's, a, it's a creative route with a lot of options. I hope there's formal and informal biologists that are tuning into all your online outreach. There's a lot of fun stuff going on. I can show everyone my macros real quick. It's wonderful. Thank you. That's a planarian and that is the water penny. Um, so I believe the water pennies are like tiny, tiny little things that you can find pretty much stuck to a rock or to the bottom of a stream and they look like this. They're going to look like little black beetles once you pick them out of the water. And um, what I like to relate them to is that if you're going tide pooling on the coast, um, they kind of look like little limpets, just pretty much suction to the side of a rock or mm. to a boulder. So that's what it kind of reminds me of. And with the planarian, I learned about these when I took a biology course at Oregon State. And I found out that if you 
kind of, they like regenerate from their own bodies. Oh, that's a fun fact. So like our lab one day was just pretty much cutting these little guys up, which was kind of sad, but um, <laughs> please respect the animals when you come into contact with them. But if you cut them or if they like are harmed in any way, they kind of just form new body segments or like selves from their bodies. So if, for example, if you just cut the, cut this one in half, you'll start having two heads after a couple of days. That is very cool. So it's pretty cool that they can regenerate, and it's really awesome if you could um, see that. And they just have these, like, funky little eyes on their heads, and that's what they pretty much look like underneath a microscope. Um, but again, if they're macroinvertebrates, you don't need a mi microscope to look at them, and they're part of the flatworm family. And okay. they're, they're pretty much... One of the coolest macros I learned about. They're all so cool. It's the the thing about, so I watched your one with birds yesterday, which was wonderful. I learned a lot of cool facts, particularly about pigeons. <laughs> um, and the thing about, you know, larger forms of wildlife, so like birds or mammals mm -hmm. or um, sometimes fish, um, is you can go out in a space and you can almost readily observe them and macro invertebrates aquatic macro invertebrates can be a little bit trickier um and in my work with odf and w i encourage people to get to know the species that live nearby a little bit better but get to know them in a respectful way that doesn't um sort of negatively influence their space mm -hmm. or their life or their stress. Um, and so if you find yourself near a stream or a creek or you're kind of out in a pond, um, something you can do is you can kind of lift up a rock and you can look on its underside and you can see what's living on there. And then if you see stuff, just, just watch it with your eyes and sort of let it be on the rock, and then you just kind of put that rock right exactly back where you found it, and um, you'd be surprised at what kind of stuff is is uh, out there living in the living in the water. Yeah, thank you for that pointer and that reminder, Emma, to just be respectful with our environment mm -hmm. and respectful to the animals that we're coming into contact with. Um, I think you mentioned before that it just takes you know, kind of more of a trained eye to really notice a lot of these details that we're missing out, especially with like these smaller critters that are beautiful and amazing and, you know, are kind of going unnoticed because we're not, you know, looking for them. So yeah, yeah that's a great opportunity to just like flip over some rocks, see what's under there, seeing like what you find and just being respectful about it. But I think we're going to wrap up now. Um, if there are any last questions or comments, please shoot them down below in this uh, comment area. And then Emma, what, is there anything you would like to add as like a final note? Um, no, I encourage everyone to stay up to date on what uh, the California Watershed Council has going on. I've uh, been really enjoyed the sort of social media approach to outdoor education that you've put together. Um, and I hope people keep keep tuning in. As a biologist, it's uh, it's kind of nice to get to feel like I'm revisiting the outdoors and still learning a lot, but um, under more like safe circumstances and sort of different circumstances than what we're used to. Awesome. Thank you for that, Emma. Um, it was really nice having you again. I'm sure some yeah, folks who are tuned in for round two love to see your face. And for those who just tuned in today or for future viewers, um, this is Emma Gardner. She's the step biologist with Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife down the Springfield District. And yeah, she is awesome. Thank you for being an amazing guest today and for like enjoying this fun activity with us and again you can find this curriculum and activity on our website at calpua.org under our outdoor school resource section and yeah and send us send us pictures of your bugs yeah i think one of the one of the um most rewarding parts of my spring is when i get to 
take my field biologist hat on and put on my outdoor education hat on. And um, I miss that right now. So it would be fun if anyone sort of makes drawings of bugs or builds bugs at home to, to send out some, send, send you the pictures mm -hmm. and, have you guys post them. Yeah, that's awesome. And I also share this with Emma as well. So if you, you know, if you um, at home are, you know, drawing your own macro vertebrate or crafting your own, please tag us um, with the Calpo Watershed Council account. And I can share them on our Instagram account, Facebook account, and with Emma as well, because I'm sure she would love to see them. Considering mm -hmm. we don't really have that personal connection with you all right now, but it's so nice to see what you all are up to. So again, thank you. Thank you, Emma. Thanks for having me. This is fun. Yeah, of course. Thank you, everyone who's tuned in right now. Um, this video will be saved. So if you want to watch us, have fun again and have fun with us, feel free to rewatch it and revisit it and share it with other folks as well.